not realise, but in school terms, uh, this week is the beginning of half term, I believe. Is that right? Goodness me. How are you going to entertain yourselves next week? I hope you're going to find lots of things to do. Uh, but uh, we're also in the church's year coming into a, a new season. It's a, a season of reflection and preparation uh, for the uh, Easter festival. And uh, we're coming, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. That's the beginning of Lent. And uh, on Wednesday itself, there are two opportunities for us to meet together, either in the morning at our uh, uh, 9.30 midweek communion service, or in the evening at 7 o'clock in the evening, there's a service of, uh, it's called the service of ashing. Have you come across that one? So that's happening at 7 o'clock in, in the evening, and uh, included as part of the communion will be uh, um, signing of the cross uh, on the forehead with ashes. And the ashes are produced from last year's palm crosses, or actually it's a few years ago palm crosses now. <laughs> but anyway, that's a couple of services this week as a preparation for uh, Lent uh, on Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. And I wanted to uh, lead us at the beginning of our service with an opening prayer, which is the collet for today. Almighty God, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We stand to bring our praise and our worship to God. Himself. 
saving me. I will offer up my life. Father God, we thank you for bringing us to this point in our journey of faith. And I pray that you will continue to lead us on as we learn more about you and we try to be more like you day by day. And we pray for your blessing now upon our young people as they discover more about your great love for them. We pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sit down now and our youngsters are going out to their groups. So, when we uh, sing songs like that and uh, we recognise our weakness before God and the way that we let God down so often. Uh, let's uh, turn to the confession and we're going to say sorry to God for things we do wrong. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. We say together, Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. 
We have not loved you with all our hearts. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, cleanse us from our sins, and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God our Heavenly Father, who's promised to forgive all those who sincerely turn to him, have mercy on each one of us, deliver us from your sins, and strengthen us for his service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, I hadn't put two and two together, but uh, as I saw David walking in, are you okay to get up the front, David? <laughs> Bless you. Uh, if it, it takes a little time, poor David's suffering. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we've got our readings now, so Dave and Margaret are going to come forward to our readings. That's it. <laughs> Right, our first <clears throat> reading is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9, the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world would bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked round, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. And now over to Kelvin. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I took a friend's funeral last week. As often happens when we were standing around by the flowers afterwards, someone came up to me. He'd been a sports journalist years ago on the Daily Express, and he said, you won't be seeing me in church because I don't believe in God. 
I said, oh, that's interesting. Which God is it that you don't believe in? This surprised him because most non-Christians think that God always means the same thing to everybody. So I got him to begin to explain about this God he didn't believe in. He talked about a being sitting up on the throne in the sky, looking down disapprovingly at the world, occasionally intervening to do miracles, sending bad people to hell while allowing good people to go to heaven. So I said, I'm not surprised you don't believe in a God like that. Neither do I. I couldn't believe in a God like that. No, I believe in the God I see in Jesus of Nazareth. And I encouraged him to read one of the Gospels. For anyone seeking to find what the God of Christianity is all about, you have to start and indeed finish with Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what the next few weeks of sermons are going to do. Today the theme is Jesus is Lord. Next week, Jesus, Son of God. And then the Messiah. And there may be others in March yet. Jesus is Lord. In our church, it just rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? In sermons and in songs. But in the Roman world at the time of Jesus, recent converts would have gasped at the implications of saying those words. For them, it was a simple yet profound testimony summarising their faith. It affirmed their belief in Jesus' divinity and pledged their allegiance to him as king. And of course, that's what those words mean for us here today as well. But for many of us, they have been stripped of that original power to shock and offend. The title, Lord, Kyrios in Greek, as in Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, was a title of the utmost respect and authority in Roman civilization, denoting power and supremacy. It was ultimately applied to the emperors, the Roman Senate proclaimed Julius Caesar Lord and God after his death. This title wasn't empty words or bland praise. The label told of Caesar's unparalleled authority and control over a vast empire. The first Roman emperor, Augustus, Gaius Octavius from 27 BC to 14 AD, was often referred to as Lord. And in the eastern provinces, he was also worshipped as a god. His successor, Tiberius, Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus, AD 14 to AD 37, was the emperor at the time of Jesus' ministry. So throughout his life, Jesus grew up in a place where Caesar is Lord was the everyday greeting of Roman soldiers, a bit like Heil Hitler. So when a Christian met a soldier, there was going to be trouble. Caesar is Lord, says the soldier. Oh, hang on a minute. Um, no, I don't think he is. Jesus is Lord. In their life, Jesus counted for far more than Caesar. It was he who was the ruler of all. He who was the king of kings. No wonder Caesar persecuted Christians. The Roman historian Tacitus describes how Christians who refused to proclaim Caesar is Lord were subjected to cruel punishment. Their declaration was a religious and political challenge. Their statement, Jesus is Lord, not only raised eyebrows, it raised fury. So the next time, you hear yourself saying the phrase, Jesus is Lord, perhaps it would be appropriate to pause for a moment, take yourself back in time to the earliest days of Christianity. Imagine the price you would have to pay for saying such a thing. The cost might well mean laying down your life. We'll come back to talk about laying down your life a bit later, but for now, let me ask a question. What 
are your dreams? What are your hopes? What are your aims? And now for a related question. What is God's dream and hope? In fact, that's an easier question than the first one because the Bible tells us the answer in Philippians 2. God's aim, purpose, his dream is that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That was the first creed of the church. If a person could say this, he was a member of the church. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And perhaps given the fuss about creeds through the long history of the church, we should have stuck with just Jesus is Lord. So what does Lord mean? Well, I've already said about its use by the emperor, but there's another way it was used. In the Old Testament, God's name is Yahweh, those four Hebrew letters. I am who I am, I will be who I will be. We're never, ever committed to one way of interpreting it. It was the name first revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3. When they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, whenever the name of God, Yahweh, appears, the word is Kyrios. To help us, many of our Bible translations, like the NIVs you have, use LORD, all in capitals, L-O-R-D, when it's the name of God, when it's Yahweh in the Hebrew. And L, lowercase o-r-d, when it just, just means Lord. When it means Lord. So sometimes you'll see Lord, Lord, when it's Yahweh, the Lord. And what does that mean? It means that saying Jesus is Lord is to say that Jesus is God Almighty. Not a great man, a wonderful preacher, a miracle worker, but God Almighty. And that means being prepared to give him an obedience, an allegiance, a loyalty, a love that we will give to no one else. And when the Lordship of Jesus is settled in the Christian's life, everything else is settled as well. When Jesus is Lord of a person's life, all our duties, obligations and responsibilities find their proper place. Hudson Taylor was a British Baptist missionary to China, founder of the China Inland Mission, which became OMF. And he said, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. This is a challenge to all of us to bring every area of our lives under the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ. He has no rival. He has no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. In our lives, there should be no rivalry for God's place in our hearts on his throne. As I said earlier, God's aim is for that day when every person who has ever lived will bow and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But for the Christian, that great confession should be an everyday reality. A Christian should live moment by moment in faithful obedience to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I've recognised as I've been preparing this sermon that sometimes in the past my language has been a bit loose about this. There was a time when I would make an appeal to a congregation like you to make Jesus Lord of your life. The Lord knew what I meant, but I'm not so sure that my hearers always did. 
we do not make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. So to you today, I'm not saying that you need to make Jesus Lord. What I am saying that he is the Lord. So surrender your lives to his sovereign rule, to his sovereign ownership. For Jesus to be ruler of your life means that he is the boss, the master of your whole life. He cannot be lord of a part. He must be given control of the entire life, the whole life. What must a person do in order for Jesus Christ to be Lord of his life? The easy answer is yield your life to him. This involves taking your hands off the controls of your life and allowing him to be in control. I was prepared for confirmation 58 years ago by the Reverend Pat Ash. In those pre-technology days, our confirmation teaching came by means of a film strip. Yes, yeah, some of us remember them winding through with one picture at a time projected onto a vicarage wall. I think the films that he used have been produced by Norman Warren, not Rick Warren, Norman Warren. It showed the new Christian handing over the keys of the house of his life to Jesus but it went on to challenge us as to whether we had handed over the keys of every room to him or whether there were still rooms in our life that we kept locked. If we agree with the phrase, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all, then every area of life must come under his lordship. Is Jesus Lord of your thoughts? Is Jesus Lord of your emotions? Is Jesus Lord of your speech, of your relationships, of your possessions? Is Jesus Christ Lord of your whole life? Does he have the key to every room in your private life? Does he have the key to every room in your public life? Is there a room marked private keep out? If so, you must be willing to surrender that key to the Lord as well. In 1 Corinthians 6 it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore honour God with your bodies. We are not our own. We were bought at a price. We belong to Jesus. We are his purchased possession. And when a person yields to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we acknowledge the Lord's ownership and give up our personal rights. Finally, the Lordship of Jesus Christ involves willing service. There must be a time in your life when you, like the prophet Isaiah, are willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. Last week, Will Catchpole reminded us of God's call on the life of every Christian as he talked about Ella's coming time in Guatemala with Latin link. He used Jesus' words, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. There are three A's to Christian service. Anywhere, anytime, and at any cost. The Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives involves our willingness to go where he sends us, when he sends us, regardless of the cost. By the way, you do know, don't you, that you should never ever say to God, anywhere but. When Jan and I were praying about where I should go for my first job as a curate, we both said anywhere but London Law, we'd both been undergraduates in London, and we really didn't want to go back there again. Where was my first curacy? Peckham. Anywhere, Lord. 
anywhere, Lord, any time, any cost. The Christian life is a wonderful life. Jesus Christ has made every provision for us to live full and abundant lives as children of God. But there is a cost involved. Such a life does not come cheaply nor easily. The life Jesus Christ has for us, his children, requires that we put Jesus first. Jesus is Lord. There can be no rivals to the throne of our life. It is to be occupied by Jesus alone. He is Lord. Yield to him. Thank you, Kelvin. And would you please stand? And we're going to join together in the creed. That's what we believe as Christians. We're going to be using the baptismal creed, we call it. It's a question and answer creed. And then after that, we're going to go straight into a song where we talk about what we believe. So, do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind? Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? Believe and trust. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now we're going to sing the same words. We believe in God the Father, maker of the universe, and in Christ, His Son, our Saviour, come to us by virgin.
please sit now and Jan Moore is going to lead us in our time of prayer together. Let us pray. Please respond after Lord in your mercy with the words, receive our prayer. Lord of all, loving Father, we live in very dangerous and troubled times. We pray that the leaders of all the nations will endeavor to find a peaceful solution to the conflicts throughout the world, and particularly in the Gaza, Palestine and Israel regions, the Ukraine, the Yemen, and in many other areas suffering aggression. Put your loving hands on their hearts and enable them to cease this strife. Lord, we feel so helpless, but know with our prayers, you will find a solution. Lord, in your mercy, this morning we thank you, Lord, that we can come to church without fear of violence or threats. We pray for all those areas in the world where there is no freedom to be a Christian, no freedom to live a normal life, where access to food and clean water is not an everyday experience. Lord, we ask that you give strength, courage, and hope to all living in these areas and change the minds of those in authority to think of the greater good. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that our lives are blessed by your love, but there are many in this country who are struggling with their lives. We pray for the homeless, those whose lives are affected by addiction, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry, those who are lonely, those who are ill, those who are housebound and those who are isolated in many ways. Let us remember all who are in need and pray for them and their future. We pray for our leaders. Let the message of the love of Lord Jesus grow in their hearts and help them to make decisions that help all our nation and the nations of the world. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will live in their hearts and change lives for the better. Lord, in your mercy. Nearer home, we thank you, Lord, for this church of St. Saviour. We pray for Andy, Mel, Kelvin, Chris and Nigel and all others who lead us in worship. We pray for all those who help in many ways to promote our fellowship. We thank you for our home groups and the fellowship in those groups. Lord, we are so thankful that the love from this church goes out in the t to the community. Give us your strength to continue to spread your love. Give us the help we need to continue with our open link. We pray for all those on our newsletter who are ill and those on our prayer chain and others known to us and to you. Put your loving arms around them and give them your peace. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We join together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jan, and thank you for everyone who's been a part of our service today. But as I regularly say, thank you to you for coming here today. It's really good to see you. And if you are uh, newcomers to the church, do make yourself known. Uh, we long to tell you what's going on here on a regular basis. And uh, uh, there are a number of things that are happening this week in particular. So uh, can I tell you about... Uh, uh, actually, you remember I said to you that... Uh, what's, what, what's Wednesday? So we've got our morning service at 9.30, uh, that's, and at 7 o'clock in the evening we have our uh, service of communion uh, with ashing. 
So that's on Wednesday this week. But if you want to prepare for that, why not come to a pancakes do? Okay, so that's on the Tuesday night. So over at uh, Holdenhurst Village Hall, uh, they have a pancakes event happening on the Tuesday evening uh, from 7.30. If anyone wants any more details and wants to book that, have a word with me at the end of the service. Uh, and then again over at Holdenhurst Village Hall on Saturday next week, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, we have our uh, men's breakfast, a full cooked breakfast with guest speaker happening next Saturday morning at 8 o'clock over at Holdenhurst Village Hall. And uh, where's Steve? There, Steve, Steve, Steve. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Singing away, jolly good. Do uh, book your place with Steve for the men's uh, uh, breakfast at 8 o'clock. Uh, and if there are others of you who are wanting to be uh, uh, come along to a prayer meeting, we have our prayer meeting at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. That's in the link here uh, at 9 a.m. Now, we have a, a dream that we're going to be opening the link on each and every day of the week. We have special events happening uh, most days, but... Um, we're just join, uh, going to be starting a Tuesday morning link open and uh, we need some more volunteers though to keep the link open uh, through that Tuesday morning. So where's Angela? Angela? <laughs> uh, should we say Alison rather than... <laughs> Yeah, why? Goodness me. What's happened to me today? <laughs> I'm at the end of a busy, busy period, so there you go. Alison, tell us about Tuesday Link. It's because I'm angelic, really. <laughs> um, I'm not going to start with Tuesday Link. I'm going to start with Monday Art Group, oh. which... If you come along and feel the buzz and the community and the fellowship and see how it's grown from very humble beginnings and people in the community are just coming along because they like us and they feel comfortable and they can share ideas and just no, no, no preaching. That then expanded into Thursday morning because we felt we could do maybe two a week and that was great and now on Thursday morning uh, we call it warm space, but it's the link, and that is now developed. And then knitting and crochet this last week, we do it first and third uh, Tuesdays. Well, the raucous laughter coming from that group. You can, yeah, A lot even, more nattering than knitting, I think. <laughs> there was that, but that's growing. And now we have people in the community coming along Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it, it's happening, it's alive. We need some more volunteers though, because uh, at the moment the crochet group's only meeting um, the first and third Tuesdays, because uh, we're letting our, our, our teachers very over, over committed, so we give her some space. But there's room there for a group of people, a couple of people to take that on and make that vibrant too. Okay, thank you. Well done, Fred. <laughs> and uh, just so you're also aware, on Friday, what happens Friday morning? Table tennis! And that is a thriving group as well. So uh, Friday mornings, table tennis at the moment. So anyway, there's, there's space for development and expansion and growth in all those areas. Oh, not this Friday. It's half term, so not this Friday. Okay, table tennis not happening this Friday. That's a good notice. Thank you. Um, but what's next Sunday in the afternoon? Messy church. Messy church. Jolly good. 
Um, I do know that we need some cakes and biscuits and such like, so there's a sign-up sheet in the link. I don't know if there's anything else that we particularly need for Messy Church, but uh, do have a word with Kaz at the end of our service to let her know uh, that you're part of the regular group and that you're coming to be part of that regular group for Messy Church next Sunday afternoon. Right, so that I don't forget anything else, Christine, anything else? You chose some goodies this week. Let's stand to sing. Or hail the power of Jesus. as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and may the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon each one of you and those whom you love now and forevermore Amen